Media Program here, and it's a great pleasure for me to receive you today for this event. We are organizing it in partnership with our friends and colleagues from Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. So uh, thanks to Mohamed Tariq who, organize, who helped us organize the event. We decided to do that because, as you know, we are one year after the beginning of the presidency of Shafkat Mirziyev. He began in, uh, interim president of Uzbekistan September 8th last year, so it has been now one year and two weeks, and we thought it would be a great moment to kind of look back at what happened in Uzbekistan during that last year. Relatively important change on the way, and so we will be discussing that. I think it's really important to now be able to follow what is happening in Uzbekistan because the country has been relatively closed for all these years and now we have way to kind of interact and get more information about things going on uh, in the country and of course it's a critical country both for strategic issues but also because it's a demographic power house of Central Asia. Every, Central Asia. every other Central Asian is an Uzbek citizen so it's really important to follow what is happening here and there. And so we have three great speakers who will be discussing that. First would be Alicia Sidik, who is the head of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, Uzbek Service. And he's based, he wasn't able to join us, but he will be with us on Skype. So thank you so much, so much Alicia, for making it. I know it's late for you already. And then we will have Sean Roberts, who is professor here at GW, working on international development and Central Asia, and who has been in Uzbekistan this last Few months, and our third speaker will be Nafaho Imamova, the uh, representative of the Uzbek Service of Voice of America, who also was in Uzbekistan just recently. So I will give each of you the floor for 15 minutes, and then we will open the, for a QA session. So Ali Sher, we you don't see us, you see just uh, Shen and <laughs> Nafaho, but we are all there, the room is full, and I give you the floor now for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm really humbled to speak to you today and thank you for showing interest uh, in this subject. It indeed has been a very dynamic year for Uzbekistan since the death of uh, iron fisted authoritarian leader Islam Karimov, who ruled the country uh, for over half a uh, quarter of a century. Um, so he was gone actually half of a century. But uh, so far, the events uh, culminated uh, with uh, President newly elected, uh, like uh, President Mirziyoyev's trip to New York, uh, where he addressed the UN General Assembly meeting. So he said, basically, it's from uh, that Central Asian cooperation is his top priority in foreign, in foreign relations and stress his readiness for any compromise. Uh, Mirzio outlined his main achievements, release of political prisoner, full currency convertibility, the best relations with neighbor, neighboring countries ever, and rehabilitation of religious inmates. So basically, uh, arguably, all of these points are have, have some truth behind them. So it's not false, all of them. Uh, and uh, but there were some concerns uh, in regards of how he to, he did his trip to, to New York. Basically, he traveled on Russian billionaire Alisher Usmanov's plane. So imagine Mr. Trump traveling somewhere on Venezuela's billionaire explain somewhere how would you react to it you know uh, how how much of conflict of interest do you see there so uh, that's that's left us very puzzled you know what's the relationship uh, uh, the puzzle is like a different type of concerns uh, I mentioned conflict of interest first of all then of course Russian influence and possible security threats that he might not even trust uh, his own security that runs planes. Uh, generally, uh, Mirziyoyev tried hard, I think. Uh, he's even, there, there, there's already so many jokes regard, in, uh, regarding his uh, 
uh, active movements. Um, so he never sleeps or something, you know, people are really kind of uh, worried about it. So uh, one day he appears in one region, in the, uh, at the same day, you know, in the afternoon in, in some, somewhere else, then he fires another district uh, official. So basically he was running like the country very manually over the whole year and uh, kind of uh, showing a lot of uh, in interference in, in every issue, I would say. Even uh, the minor, it went into like wedding parties, you know, for, you know, kind of uh, showing this concerning uh, kind of elements of his future presidency. So basically, but on the other hand, he was uh, in some way uh, better than his predecessor, uh, and uh, in some way showing more progressive kind of moves. The, uh, so, Mirziaev, uh, it's, it's very important to ask who is President Mirziaev, who whom Uzbekistan have elected as his uh, leader for the upcoming years, I would say. At least I could quote Mirziaev himself saying that he's, he came for years, to, 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 to be there for years. Uh, and uh, basically, the guy was very patient. Uh, he was uh, out of radar. He was a uh, shadow mechanism of Karimov's regime, uh, patiently waiting for his turn and for the chance to become a president. So he never appeared on Uzbek television, never delivered any public speeches. So, and suddenly uh, the whole agreement uh, between uh, Uzbek elites, Russian uh, security, uh, pointed that he would be the best candidate, and they agreed on 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 on, on him, you know, internally in the, in the closest circles. So, however, uh, there were rumors and speculations during the year that uh, security services were not totally happy with him. So, and of course. Uh, over the whole year, we haven't heard a single statement by Mirziyoy or any uh, kind of a thing that would be related with uh, Uzbekistan National Security Service. So the status quo is, let me, let me do everything, let me, uh, let me be kind of everywhere and uh, interfere everywhere, even to the weddings, but such an important issue like a national security service that is the crucial, you know, you keep silence. So this is, uh, for us, that was a big, a big signal that uh, he's not under control. He's not fully controlled the situation. Uh, his uh, jumping on Usmanov's uh, Russian billionaire's plane was also very uh, strange. Uh, it, it, it also uh, accompanied the, these, the rumors that there were um, uh, about possible, possible security threats. So we don't know everything, but uh, that that what we what we are hearing, you know, from the ground. The currently current situation is also very uh, very volatile. The chairman of National Security of Uzbekistan, uh, Ruslan Minoyatov, is in is in hospital. Uh, so he has the pharmaceutical poisoning. Uh, we we have a very close person uh, releasing his uh, uh, latest uh, uh, condition. Uh, the condition is uh, uh, medium heavy state. So the pharmaceutical poisoning was uh, caused by mixing uh, two drugs that he was he, he, he started using a new pill for his uh, diabetes and that was kind of uh, confronted with the, with the, with the old one. Uh, so that's the, the delicate situation. Uh, we don't know how he will 
come out of it? Like, he would, would he recover from it or, uh, or, or things will change? And uh, we don't know whether Verziaev will appoint someone who would be, who would be uh, loyal to him. And uh, we have a couple of names for the possible uh, replacement of Inoyato. Uh, but that remains to be seen. So that's the, you know, Uzbek National Security Service is a very big topic and like it's a, it's a most, most important topic because uh, as you know, uh, during President Karim's time, that was the only leading, uh, they, they were everywhere and they were running the whole country basically. Karimov was there, but he was not that controlling as, as, as he would want us, you know, think about. Uh, so, in many cases, Mirziyoyev confronted National Security Service over the year. Uh, in the case of uh, uh, visa, you know, lifting visa requirements for uh, Western countries, he announced about it, but then uh, pulled back, uh, apparently because of security concerns. Uh, he also uh, announced about the lifting of uh, uh, exit visa visa regime, but it was also replaced by foreign passports. Uh, also, uh, uh, you know, not a very free kind of uh, system. Uh, raises lots of uh, concerns about how easy people, how easily people will be getting those passports. Uh, he had uh, uh, made some changes uh, in, uh, uh, in economy. He tried to convince the world that Uzbekistan, now it's the time to invest in Uzbekistan. But it, it was, it is very uh, difficult shot uh, after so many, after ongoing scandals with the, with the leading companies, the telecom with, with his daughter, uh, it was the daughter of President Karimov, you know, uh, with the, with so many investors being cheated for so many years, uh, they tried to uh, kind of uh, uh, to soften the, the regime for foreign investors. They invited several Turkish investors who were previously driven out of Uzbekistan and their properties confiscated. They offered them a new property, new thing, just to open up, you know, uh, a little bit. But that seems not, not working very well. Now, uh, the latest claim is that America and Uzbekistan signed $2.6 billion uh, worth, you know, contracts worth of 2.6 billion with the, with the leading companies like Honeywell. That that's also need to be checked and double checked, I would say, because uh, uh, what are those contracts? Are those memorandums or or real kind of a thing? It's it's still kind of uh, very vague, and uh, in in the media, yes, uh, media became more. Uh, open, uh, a little bit open, was uh, two steps forward, uh, one step back. Uh, but pe the media started talking about problems without criticizing those who caused that problems. Yeah. So uh, or attacking prosecutors for increasing the price for, for, for high prices. Yeah. For one of the you know TV shows of the recent one that I had to watch, they they stop attacking the prosecutor's office because prices are going up. And the rhetoric is why the prosecutor's office is not controlling prices. So that's kind of uh, the, the, the basis you, you can watch on a daily basis on Uzbek television. But as I said, uh, journalists, uh, you know, especially websites, they are more open and uh, uh, willing to, to cover issues. For the first time, uh, they, they picked up our report yesterday about the death of a woman uh, in the cotton field. So it's kind of a big thing, yeah. Uh, 
uh, if they, <coughs> both media, uh, picked up that report, of course they don't refer to Ozone Leak, like to RFRL, we don't care. But uh, it's a big thing that they um, accepted this as a report. So um, that's basically it. The major concern, as I said, uh, is Russia. Uh, is Russian um, is Russian influence over the situation. Uh, Russian FSB is uh, uh, providing a presidential guard to President Mirziyoyev. Uh, President Mirziyoyev uh, refused. Uh, they dismissed all the previous presidential guard. The head of previous presidential guard now is having a customs 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 uh, committee. Uh, he's not using president, former president's compounds, offices, uh, residences, his, his cars, uh, his plane. So uh, even he's even travel. He's traveling a different road that President Karimov used to travel. So basically, uh, he's making as much as possible the kind of. Uh, to, to distance from the previous regime, and at the same time, given the fact that uh, uh, that Karimov was so popular, I don't know, uh, among people, he's still kind of uh, referring to him as his father, while keeping his daughter in prison. It's a, it's a pretty crazy situation, I would say. So. Uh, Kind of, uh, you have to be Uzbek to understand how, you know, to, to keep everything in your head at the same time, yeah? So, uh, it's pretty crazy, I would say. Um, so, uh, the big thing, the, the, the new rising stars, the new Gulnara and Lolas are Oybek and Otabek, his son-in-laws. Uh, Oybek is already uh, started bringing um, his uh, old friends from Russia, from the underworld. Last week we reported about the massive arrests in Tashkent in, among criminal uh, underworld. You know, as a post-Soviet criminal underworld is very much uh, kind of, uh, is a big factor in, in, the, in, in, uh, in power. So controlling the streets basically is one of the things that the president should, should be doing. So uh, the streets were not under Mirziyoyev's control, and now gradually Oybek is, uh, is, is, is leading that effort, bringing his old friends from Moscow, from Russia, uh, with the links to Chechen groups, to Putin. So you have all this mix that's going on at the same time in the, uh, uh, you know, then, uh, the, the friends, they're also coming to, to businesses, so new business people appearing. So they are rising stars. Let's see uh, what, how, how fast they evolve into our beloved uh, ladies. And it's, it's, it needs to be seen, yeah, of course. And uh, on the other hand, President Mirziyoyev controls his son-in-laws uh, and keeping them very close to, each other, to, to him. So in the morning, they travel to him to work and come back from work all together. Yeah. One of his son-in-law is his uh, uh, chief of his uh, guards, like deputy, but he's chief, actually. And uh, the second is, uh, uh, is, is responsible for the cabinet, like all his schedules. And uh, so pretty close, the closest associates, I would say. So these are just the main outlines, but if there, there's more, there are there will be more questions. I'm very happy to respond. Thank you so much, Alicia. That was really a wonderful kind of insight in what is happening in the country. Now, I would like to give the floor to Sean for his own presentation. Thank you. Um, first of all, let me apologize. Um, my toddler started pre-K last week. She brought me this present. <laughs> If my voice holds up, <clears throat> I'm going to be talking about uh, prospects for change in Uzbekistan. Um, and uh, what I like to term uh, Uzbekistan's revolution from above. Um, 
first of all, it's important to point out that um, there's both expected and surprising things related to the succession of presidency in Uzbekistan. Uh, for years, analysts and experts have speculated about succession in Central Asia, in particular Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, um, that have had both the longest term presidents um, and some of the most powerful personalities. Um, <clears throat> the, the speculation has been varied. Uh, some people expected some sort of Putin-esque uh, anointment of a successor previously, you know, previous to uh, the president stepping down. Others suggested imminent chaos coming out of a, a succession. Uh, and I think <clears throat> the one that I had agreed with most of all was that you would likely see a smooth transition, and you would likely see somebody from the inner circle of Karimov's administration take over, who would then maintain the status quo. So in some ways, that's happened, and in other ways it hasn't happened. So it's happened in the sense it was a smooth transition. <coughs> Mirza Yoya was the long-term prime minister to uh, Karimov. Uh, he was certainly in the inner circle. Uh, it seemed to be very much an elite managed transition. Um, however, Mirza Yoya has not sought to maintain the status quo. In fact, I would uh, say that he's systematically dismantling the system that Karimov built. Um, and this is somewhat surprising. Um, now, <clears throat> before, I, I'm gonna explain some of the reasons I think that um, it's worthwhile taking Mirza Yoyev's reform agenda at face value. Um, but before doing that, I do wanna point out why I call this a revolution from above. Uh, first of all, in April when I was in Tashkent, I went to one of these great corner stores that have beer on tap. And I sat with a guy who was an Uzbek who had worked in the EU uh, for a while and he'd just come back and he said, this is a revolution from above. This is the only way that Uzbekistan can change. Um, and I was kind of struck by that. Um, secondly, I think the concept of a revolution from above is interesting in the context of uh, the former Soviet Union. We haven't seen many states in the last decade or 15, maybe 20 years in the former Soviet Union take, undertake radical reforms from above. What we've seen are uh, several revolutions from below or what appear to be revolutions from below where you had popular protest movements force change in places like Ukraine, Kyrgyzstan, and Georgia. So, um, <clears throat> you know, as, as a scholar, I'm kind of interested to watch how this unfolds as a, as a comparison down the road. You know, what are the benefits to a very well-planned transition from above versus something that's more spontaneous, and what might be some of the drawbacks to that? Now, I should note, uh, there's some limits to this comparison. In many ways, what we're seeing in Uzbekistan right now is, is a return to the 1990s. We're seeing, you know, Uzbekistan go from zero to 100 overnight, or trying to. <clears throat> and if the reforms are successful, it may just be that Uzbekistan gets to a point similar to what we saw in Ukraine, Georgia, and Kyrgyzstan prior to uh, the revolutions that took place there. Um, <clears throat> now, first of all, to understand what the changes are um, that the, pre the new president of Uzbekistan is implementing. It's important to look at this five-pronged development strategy that he has published and made a big deal of within Uzbekistan that's aimed to make changes between 2017 and 2021. Um, I'll just I'll read out the uh, five priority areas that he's outlined improvement of state and social construction, um, which sounds like a very kind of Soviet desk idea. Most of the detail on that uh, has to do with the liberalization of the political space. However, on the other hand, a lot of that is somewhat uh, murky in the details, um, which I think is important to point out. Secondly, um, the rule of law and the furtherance of judicial reform. 
And this is interesting that this is not part of the improvement of state and social construction. This is completely separate. And there's lots of evidence that um, he's pushing these reforms through very quickly. Third, economic development and liberalization. Uh, four, development of social services. Five, a kind of catch-all, but I think actually very important area of priority, security, inter-ethnic harmony, religious tolerance, and the implementation of balanced, mutually beneficial, and constructive foreign policy. And this gets to something Ali Sher was talking about, that they, the, the new administration is really pushing increased cooperation within Central Asia and is trying to change Karimov's foreign policy, which was quite, um, quite closed uh, in many ways. So the reasons I think <clears throat> it's worthwhile taking this agenda at face value is, one, there's no real incentive for uh, Uzbekistan or no track record from Uzbekistan um, trying to fake liberalization for the, inter the benefit of the uh, kind of Western liberal states. Um, that's something we've seen in a lot of countries, uh, you know, as a way to attract foreign assistance and so on. But Uzbekistan has generally um, been an exception to that kind of behavior in the past. Um, they really pushed that there should be an Uzbek way in domestic policy. In my experience talking to uh, government functionaries in April this year in Uzbekistan is that they still feel very firmly that they want to reform on their own terms. Um, so there, I really don't think it makes sense to say, oh, this is just pandering to the international community. Um, and furthermore, I should mention, there's also the case that Western liberal states increasingly don't really care about liberalization in the developing world. Um, you know, kind of led by the Trump foreign policy, but also in Europe there's kind of a, 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 kind of a, a movement away from the promotion of democratization and liberalization. Um, on the other hand, there's real incentives for the government to want to reform. First of all, I think that, um, and, and my kind of working hypothesis on this, is that Mirziyoyev, as a longtime prime minister, having to implement Karimov's policies, um, knew the problems that these policies were creating uh, and the potential dangers that they would present in the future. Um, the first is Karimov's oppressive regime created substantial opposition abroad many of whom have joined extremist groups over the years. Um, you know, and I think uh, it's, it's really a case where uh, the government has spawned its own extremist opposition. Um, and a lot of them are now fighting in Syria as, as fighting their wings as a question, will they want to come back home? If the status quo remains in Uzbekistan, will they focus on this? Um, so, I mean, this explains a lot of why Mirza Yoyev is really trying to soften the government's stance on religion, among other things. Second, Primov's economic system uh, was really unsustainable, particularly in the context of Uzbekistan's youth bulge. Um, and this seems really clear um, that the Uzbek government understands this and wants to change this because um, they're very much focused on bringing in foreign investment. They understand that they need to have jobs for the next generation. Um, I mean, obviously we already see the number of Uzbek citizens who are migrant laborers abroad, uh, and I think it's rational that the government wants to reverse that situation and begin to create economic opportunity locally. Um, I won't go too much into kind of the demonstrations of uh, the political will to reform, but you know, as Ali Sher mentioned, there has been real change in foreign policy. Um, I think uh, a lot of analysts were poo-pooing the government's political will to take care of currency convertibility. They seem to be going pretty full force ahead on that. I mean, there's still time we'll see whether um, it is fully implemented, but um, I, I got the sense talking to people in the Ministry of Finances, for example, that 
they completely understood that there's no way they can bring forward investment to the country if there's not convertibility. Um, particularly if you want that forward investment uh, producing things for the local market because otherwise they can't convert that money back into hard currency. Um, also, there's definitely been a certain thawing in terms of political prisoners. Um, I think it hasn't been fully realized, but we're seeing some of that. As I mentioned, there's some uh, kind of more leniency to pious Muslims. There's review of all people who were um, uh, in prison for extremism. Um, and uh, Uzbekistan accepted a delegation from Human Rights Watch. Um, to come to a country, uh, which was uh, the first in a long time. So there's certainly some demonstration of things happening. On the other hand, <clears throat> there's not really a serious movement on building the institutions needed for a liberal democracy. Um, now, there's different ways to interpret that, um, but it seems that that's not the top priority at this point. And so what does that mean? the government's really reforming to? Is it trying to reform to a liberal democracy? Um, or is it trying to reform to a more managed democracy, uh, softer authoritarian uh, structure like you see perhaps in Kazakhstan, in Russia, in Azerbaijan? Um, all logic would point to the latter. It makes a lot more sense. Um, you know, looking at the, the region, uh, certainly if there's uh, increased ties with Russia, um, and um, still, if that was to happen, that would be a revolution compared to what we had um, just a year ago. Um, so I think that there's a lot to be said for those changes. Um, now, the one caveat, it is possible, and it interests me as somebody interested in uh, democratization, that the Uzbek government wants to get the rule of law right first before implementing any kind of political liberalization. Um, and if that is the case, it would be very interesting to see how that plays out. Because we know in countries like Ukraine, Georgia, and Kyrgyzstan, where you have political democracy uh, in many ways, uh, the rule of law is the weak point. And it, and it leads to uh, massive corruption, client politics, and so on. Um, so, Finally, to get to the big question, which Ali Sher is taking most of uh, most of this already, is are these reforms sustainable? Um, if they're serious, if we're going to say that we should take them at face value, can they be realized? And the big question, really, I think, you know, beyond there's a question of capacity, whether the government can actually get all these things done, but beyond that, there's also this question of are there real opponents? to reform within the higher echelons of the Uzbek elite. And it would seem logical that there would be. Um, the National Security Service is uh, the first one that comes to mind. Uh, and as Ali Sher has already mentioned, that has become, there's lots of speculation about uh, whether the National Security Service has pushed back on certain reforms. Uh, there's even a couple of rumors going around <coughs> an attempt to assassinate Mirziyoyev on his trips abroad by the National Security Service. And this also is connected to the Usmanov plane uh, rumor and so on. So whether those are real or just rumors, um, it shows you that a lot of people are concerned about this relationship between the security organs and the new presidential administration. Secondly, state-owned enterprises. Um, I didn't realize until I started to look at this how powerful these organizations are. Uzbek Air Airways, Uzbek Railway, they own much more than the airlines and the railways. They own all kinds of different enterprises within the country. So obviously, to them, the economic liberalization, bringing in foreign investors is going to be a certain threat. And so how much are they going to push back? Um, finally, <clears throat> Uzbekistan is famously opaque. We don't know exactly who within the elite controlled the black market for currency exchange, but there were some people making a lot of money off of that. Um, and so if they bring in full convertibility, that's going to reduce a, a revenue, serious revenue stream for, for certain people. So 
obviously that could be something that um, is problematic. So I just want to end my talk on one point. Um, so if we take the Mirza Yoya regime, uh, regime administration at, at face value of really wanting to reform the country, um, and we assume that there are serious opponents to these reforms uh, within the elite uh, and within the old guard, um, how can those people interested in realizing the reforms succeed? A lot of people have been saying, you know, he has to consolidate power. Um, and the route that the president seems to have been taking to consolidate power, interestingly, has been by trying to win popular support. From the very outset, he was setting up these <coughs> things he called the virtual cabinet where people could report uh, issues that they had on the street and, and you know, corruption from government agencies and so on. And he would try to order um, the people in the government to take care of these issues for people. So that's one thing he's trying to do. The question that stands out to me is whether he needs to um, actually liberalize the political space to a certain extent to really consolidate his power. Because um, if you just work on populism alone, uh, that can't really bolster your power. But if you were able to actually have a structure where there were more independent NGOs, media, um, even perhaps a liberalization of the political party system, would that, uh, it, it, and you had people within those kinds of institutions supporting his reform agenda, that could have a, a real positive impact in terms of realizing the things that he's trying to get done. So I'll leave it at that and we'll, uh, you're welcome to ask any questions. Thank you so much, Sean, for this great presentation. I propose we keep the question at the end, and I now would like to give the floor to Nav Bajo so she can continue the discussion. Um, thank you so much. It's wonderful um, to be here. Um, just like Sean, I'm also suffering from this, so it's not happened. Uh, I spent three days in New York covering the UAGA on the Vice President Rosiata's trip, which was a very interesting thing to, uh, to, to observe, um, to watch uh, President Rosiata in action. Um, and, and also to see how the system works now that you have a different person in charge. Um, and um, there were many disappointments for me, disappointments for me as a journalist, because of course I, you know, I was really um, troubled by the fact that they tried to uh, keep the foreign media away from uh, from the scene, and uh, the foreign media was just us, the Voice of America, news by service. It wasn't like you know there were a group of journalists following them. <laughs> Um, the president, but what also what it also demonstrated is that this uh, the fact that the attitude, the policy, or the kind of media that they have no control on has not changed. So they are still very careful um, of of others, um, despite the fact that they know our content, and they know that we exist, and they know that we try to you know maintain a very professional relationship uh, with the regime. Um, it was very interesting, so I had a lot to say to the Uzbek diplomats and to whoever, you know, whichever official I, I got to uh, to talk to. But um, the, uh, what I saw was that was his new security. Who kept you? Um, no, not necessarily the security uh, per se. It's the it's it's the group of people, you know. And if I would, I let's just call it the Uzbek government. In yeah, 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 exactly. And it wasn't like they were keeping me, you know, I, we were in the business forum yesterday morning, for example. Uh, we had access to some events, but in general, I mean, I wanted to interview the president, right? I mean, I, I thought that, you know, if, if he is this guy who seems to be so open and so flexible and so willing to talk, let's talk. I mean, you know, if he has not given any interviews, then this was, I thought this would, this would be a really good opportunity for him to, to chat, at least give a comment to a Uzbek language media, you know, outside of Uzbekistan. Uh, so that didn't happen. But, I mean, the bigger picture is that this is still a very nervous, um, careful, uh, and to a great extent authoritarian regime that, you know, that, that we have. Uh, I was in, uh, in Uzbekistan um, July, August, and I had been to the country two years ago, and every time I travel to Uzbekistan, I actually travel as a, not as a journalist, but as an Uzbek citizen, and this is why I, Whatever I see here will really be my own views because I've never traveled to Uzbekistan as a voice of American um, journalist, and we don't.
don't do any work from inside, from inside the country. Uh, what I saw this time was this incredible um, high morale. You could actually sense the positive energy in the country. And uh, the way people were willing to talk, to share their thoughts, the way people feel connected to the government, you know, whatever they see as the government. Uh, and uh, the, the vibrant media environment, uh, the, the open conversations. I mean, I was trying to be as discreet as possible because, again, I'm travel traveling as a private person. But the amount of people who are reaching out to talk, to brainstorm, you know, from within the system, from the, you know, governmental, non-governmental community, from, uh, from different walks of life. And people who are really um, excited about what's happening and to me, that's one of Mirziad's accomplishments, actually. I mean, it would be very naive for us to see that all these changes started happening in Mirziad and came to power. That would actually be really inaccurate. I think the country was never static. We knew it. The country was evolving, you know, not in the kind of a, a, a pace that a lot of us wanted to see, but in a way that any country was because of the, you know, various factors, right? I mean, the, the fact that you have uh, millions of Uzbek citizens abroad, the country has never been connected to the world um, this much. And, uh, and it's, it was becoming incredibly difficult for the Kremlin regime to control the flow of information, to control the, uh, the movement. And uh, so what happened was this incredible transformation of, uh, of Prime Minister Mirziyayev into F President Mirziyayev. I think it's that there is so much there to analyze, so much to study. Uh, I think that's that's fascinating because many of us did not expect that if Mirziyayev became president of Uzbekistan, he would be like this, you know. And I was one of those people who would always say that in no way, I don't think Mirziyayev has a chance to become the next president. We thought that he had a lot of baggage, that he had such a negative reputation, but we didn't know much about him. And now we're getting to know him as you know in his new uh, in his new position. And Tashkent was so vibrant. People seemed to be at work all the time, day and night. People were going to work at 2 a.m. You know, they had meetings at 3 a.m. And everybody seemed to be um, wanting to be somewhere because, especially, and I'm talking about the people who I was talking to who were part of the system, they constantly expected that there would be some kind of an unexpected meeting and then the president would be involved and they somehow would be involved. Like a school director in Namanya. Uh, was rushing to a meeting with the president. I'm like, how? I mean, you're in Nelligan. You're in a village in Nelligan. He says, no, uh, President Mirziyayev is having a meeting with, with, you know, that focuses on our region, and I have to be on the phone, and I have to be available. If he happens to talk about our school, you know that you need to be able to reach me. So, is he in control of the country? I think he is. But I think in a very different way than, than Karimov, he's also delegating responsibility in the eyes of the public which I think is giving enormous responsibility to those who are in lower levels, you know? So the people of Uzbekistan, uh, I would say, which is really good news, are finally getting to know who their leaders are. You know, so you have President uh, you know, Mirziyoyev, you can blame him for a lot of things, but then, you know, there is a district mayor, you know, there is a regional governor, there are people in between who, should, who you should know and who you should go to to resolve your issues. So in that sense, this virtual cabinet that you were mentioning has been such a dramatic um, push. Everybody's talking about that Patal. You know, it's just simply known as Patal. There is so much discussion of politics, Uzbek politics, you know, something that we used to not really even make any reference to. So, I mean, these are my observations. Obviously, you know, I'm devil's advocate, you know, I have my own personal analysis about this and this, and I can ask a gazillion questions, but if you were to look at the bigger picture and what is happening in the country, people seem to be very inspired by the new, uh, by the new president, and there is this realization, which is very timely, which basically says, you know what? He's leading us, but the real work will be done by us. So this is our issue, and you know, maybe we finally have a person who will let us run our own destiny. It's not like, you know, the Uzbeks lived on a different planet and did not think that they were never in control of their own destiny. But now there's this feeling that he will let us run our own, you know, path and he will support us. But from Rizem's perspective, what I saw was he knows that the hunger for change is obvious. He cannot control that. And, and he's determined to channel that energy to a direction that he wants and he wants to lead, and he 
wants to gain, you know, to increase his political, social, perhaps even, you know, financial capital. To explore. He's really gonna, yeah, exactly. And uh, through this process, I think he also wants to consolidate power. And um, and I think he's genuine in, in in seeing that through this through this strategy, you know, he wants to move the country. So he wants to consolidate power. He wants to stay. I mean, he wants to make sure that he's the most powerful person in the country. But he also wants, as he does this, he also wants to, you know, to move the country forward. And that is a very uh, you know, difficult process. And I think it's going to be very difficult because <coughs> the fundamental challenges in, you know, in Uzbekistan are you know, still the same. It's the authoritarian nature of the regime, the fact that the education system has to be to a great extent, the healthcare system has to be to a great extent, and then the strength of the security service, this monster, right? Sometimes people uh, refer as, and you know, I share was so right in, in pointing out that the security services have infiltrated every walk of life. So you know, that is still the problem, you know, and um, and then you have corruption in every you know uh, uh, corner of the Uzbek society. You have the criminal business elite. What are they going to do? You know, with them, and they control so much, and, and corruption is so widespread and ingrained that, you know, Mirzai will, will definitely face pushback if uh, if the elite starts to lose money in that status. I think that's that's really, really important. Uh, and at the same time, I think Mirzai will, uh, will uh, face uh, the possibility of widespread uh, disappointment if the pace of these changes that people are expecting, you know, and that great expectation is being raised every day, if that stops, I think that would be a big problem. <coughs> so he has a lot to do in terms of expect, uh, managing the expectations. He um, he knows he has the authority to do a lot of things, obviously, right? I mean, he's the president. But I, I see him as someone who's also trying to win the hearts and minds of these big people as a leader. And uh, when you listen to him, at least if you're sitting in a hospital in Uzbekistan, with everyone else, people look at him as you know what I have to get up and do something about this. Like he's making me, you know, he's, he's calling me for action, and that's what he did yesterday when he met those 18 compatriots that were uh, in, chosen in a very careful way to meet, uh, you know, President Roosevelt in New York. I so wish I would be one of them, but I wasn't. But they chose very impressive people uh, who represented different ages, different um, spheres, and he basically. Uh, Mirziyadov talked to them just like he talks, you know, every day in Uzbekistan. Uh, and basically said, you know what, we have a lot of issues in the country. And there isn't a topic that we need to discuss. Everything is up for discussion. Uh, we don't censor. That's, those are the words, you know, so speak your mind. Tell me what I should do and what you can do for the country. And that the government uh, is determined to serve the people of Uzbekistan, not the way out, you know, the other way around. And you know, whatever he says, I mean, people are enjoying listening to him, you know? So, uh, I mean, people, I mean, you should have seen the excitement on people's faces when they were coming out. They're like, I'm ready to go home. I'm like, really? You know? So the interesting thing is not just what's happening in terms of the leadership, but what's happening to the Uzbek people, right? What is the impact and effect of all these, uh, uh, the, the, the new dynamics? You have millions of Uzbeks living. Um, you have hundreds of thousands living in the United States. So when you know when President Mirziyad comes out and he says, you know what, we have changed policy. We think you're wonderful. We need you. you the country needs you. You're no longer these, uh, you know, the negative the characters that you know we. I mean, the the the, the discussion of the taboos, whatever was taboo in Uzbekistan, the openness about it has been pretty impressive. You know, the attitude has changed. Where you know the Uzbeks living abroad are no no longer seen as the enemy. Said, like, how do we lure them back? Uh, and when president says, you know, um, which means like, I really need solid professionals to come and do the work. When whoever I talked to in Uzbekistan seems to acknowledge that fact that this human capital that we used to brag about in Uzbekistan, these great professionals we had, you know, it's no longer there. So there is this acknowledgement that the country needs to move forward. There is a lot of work to be done, and no matter. You know how happy or disappointed we'll be with President Mirzayev. There is so much work ahead, and 
and do we have the right people? Like who should? Like you know, there has been so much chaos in terms of running the state broadcasting system. Do we have the right people to run? Who should run? How should we manage the system? I think those conversations being carried out openly mm -hmm. is, is, is progress. So I came back from Uzbekistan basically thinking that oh my God, you know, like be careful of what you wish for, right? There is so much to do for or to think about if you are an Uzbek living abroad. And you know, is is this opening it good enough for me to start thinking of what I can, you know, do for my country? And if you're inside the country, is it, you know, then what is what is the next step? So people seem to be empowered. And as I was saying earlier, people are getting to know their leaders. There is so much political discussion on TV. I mean, you know, you can easily get bored too because they're one hour, two hour discussions. They were being carried out live for a while and um, um, that ended now for a while, and now we're anticipating a new, uh, new beginning of those live shows. So this, you know, this thing about how oh my God, Uzbeks cannot handle live television. That discussion is over. I mean, Uzbeks can more than handle live television, and they're finally getting to talk to each other. They're finally getting to hear each other. Uh, people finally seem to be talking about leaders other than president. You know, they are the diputats, the lawmakers, the district mayor. And through this virtual cabinet, you know, when they get the letters back from president's office, the letters, you know, in detail basically says what to do. You go to your district office, there is this guy who's in charge of this issue, you go talk to him, and this person then should resolve your problem. So people feel very empowered to go and resolve their issues because it's been, you know, they have this proof, right, that the government is taking care of them. Uh, all of that is selling really well for president. What will happen, you know, what is his deadline? It's very hard to talk about it. When do we, is, you know, there is, nothing is uh, unconditional, right? I mean, who's like story <coughs> of patients? I mean, what they can do afterwards is, is, is another story, but I think there is so much pressure on President Muziak now, now that he's also spoken uh, from an international arena, yeah. And, uh, I mean, this was, I think he went home very happy uh, from the meetings and the conversations that he had in New York, but uh, I'm sure he's also realizing that this build-up, you know, pressure is, is really on him because the world is, you know, is watching him and there's, if there is new Uzbekistan, we have to see it, right? So, I mean, I mean there's a lot more to say, but I hope that we can talk about it. Well, thank you so much. Enough, Bakola.